Visit expressvpn.com slash yang and get three extra months of ExpressVPN for free. The Republican Party, I disagree with them on pretty much everything. But what I, what I do admire about Republicans is they unapologetically fight for their agenda. You know, they unapologetically fight for their kind of, you know, hard right, almost, you know, white nationalistic agenda at times, especially Donald Trump, hard line on immigration. <laughs> you know, he's very it's unapologetic. It's funny you describe that. There, there was another guy who came on, uh, Matt Jones, who's a Democrat from Kentucky, and, and he said something that really, really stuck with me. He said that um, one thing Republicans do better than Democrats is they let some of like the internal um, fights uh, take their course. The Democratic Party is always trying to like like stick I- its nose in kind of earlier in the um, in the process to try and keep um, progressives or folks who who they think are in your mind like unrealistic from like actually getting the resources necessary to um, become the the party's nominee in those races under the guise of electability. But there's like more to it than electability. And, and I think he was right. I think I was like, wow. So in that way, Republicans are more like lowercase d Democratic because they'll really just let the will of the people, even if the people choose, in some cases, like some freaking loons, because there are some freaking loons like <laughs> absolutely <laughs> like, that are like, like, like that. peddling conspiracy theories. So while the Republicans kind of unapologetically fight for their agenda and they fight for their base, the Democrats, they 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 they're always wanting to moderate their message. How's Georgia? Georgia's great. It really is quite nice. Um, been knocking on doors, doing press, um, just doing anything I can to rouse energy. I'm doing an event with high school Democrats um, this week. Uh, young people love me. So, yeah, it, it's been really good. I, I think Reverend Warnock wants me in an ad, too, which is very flattering. Thank you, Reverend Warnock. Um uh, it's been dynamite, but even while I've been here, you know that we've been working on cash relief feverishly. And I have to say, I think we've had our high water mark legislative achievement where you've probably seen, yeah. if you're listening to this, the stuff that's going on in Congress where uh, it was gridlock, uh, no deal was happening. And then a group of bipartisan senators got together and said, hey, here's a $908 billion deal. Wouldn't this be great? And then everyone's like, oh my gosh, a compromise bill. But you know what the compromise bill did not have in it? Money for people. Stimulus checks. Cash for people. Everyone's favorite thing about the last CARES Act. Economists' favorite thing about the last CARES Act. Where money in our hands is the most important thing. So then uh, we sprang into action. And now there is a bipartisan... House bill that says, look, this thing needs to include checks for people, stimulus checks, cash. And the co-sponsors of this bill, I am so excited and proud. And if, if you are on social media, you should follow these two people because they really stepped up. Lisa Blunt Rochester, uh, Democratic Congresswoman uh, from Delaware, and David McKinley, a Republican congressman from West Virginia. Now think about that that pair, they stepped forward and said, look, this is bipartisan. Everyone wants it. And now dozens of members of Congress are coming out of the woodwork saying, yeah, like, obviously we should have cash in this thing. Uh, So thank you to everyone who supported Humanity Forward because you made this happen. We made this happen. Uh, I've had over 50 calls with members of Congress. I just had one earlier today. Uh, And uh, they are generally surprised to hear that three quarters of Americans are for this. Um, but they've been hearing tales of suffering from their communities and they realize that, you know, we, we need to get cash on the table. So, uh, so we're making this happen. Uh, and this period of time is the crucial time because we can all see from the calendar, December doesn't have that many days left. Congress needs to reauthorize funding for the government. Uh, the deadline was December 11th. They pushed it to the 18th. So this is the window when relief will actually either leave 
Congress and get signed into law before year end, or it will not. And certainly we're all rooting for one, it to pass and two, for it to include cash for the people. It's kind of exciting is like we can actually say the the work we've been doing had a pretty big hand in this. Like, I don't care what the press says, like they, you know, they'll ignore you or whatever they normally do. But the reality is we've been moving this ball forward. This is the greatest thing I have ever touched. You know, the greatest thing, like if if if, if we can unlock, let's call it 120 to 200 billion dollars for everyday Americans. I mean, like, like who can do that? That's, you know, like you could work, mm-hmm. frankly, like, you know, thousands of lifetimes and, and like never, uh, never come, come near that. Um, so the fact that you, me, everyone who's listening to this, if you supported uh, Humanity Forward helped make this happen, this would be the greatest thing I have been a part of if we helped get hundred the billions of dollars out the door that actually was heading straight to people, families, households. Really, like, what, what can top that? So pumped to, to have had a hand in this, but we need to do more, and Congress needs to do a whole lot more. Yeah. Um, so the efforts we're making have been high ROI very, very quickly. And it's been... This is... I think that the actual headline is that this is the first bipartisan cash relief bill ever proposed. And that is exciting and uh, is looking more promising every day. So thank you, Yang Gang and listeners, if you have donated. Donate to Humanity Forward. It's literally like a hundred million percent return for the country. Or you really cannot top that. Uh, Seriously. And and I got to say, like talking to these members has been very encouraging where uh, Lisa Blunt Rochester was the secretary of labor in Delaware. So she's acutely aware. She's also the co-founder of the Future of Work Caucus that exists uh, so she is all over this stuff. Uh, yeah. And David McKinley representing West Virginia, like he sees what's going on when people are struggling. I mean, West Virginia has has some some issues uh, mm-hmm. and, uh, you know, like he wants to help. So it, it's really and it's not just them. I mean, again, I've had uh, dozens of conversations where, uh, you know, it, it, it's really interesting, Zach. And I'm going to talk about this, uh, I think, with you in a minute. When you talk to excellent people in Congress and there are excellent people in Congress, like it really makes clear just how messed up the system is that you can like embed right. uh, dozens of excellent people in a system that uh, like, you know, is not clicking. It's not delivering value to the American people. Um, so in, in many ways, I think we have to try and extricate ourselves from the people, which is very hard to do. Uh, if you, you know, if you're a person yourself or, you know, a journalist, like extricate yourself from the people and look at the structures and the institutions uh, as to why things aren't working. I, I've been so frustrated. And I think a lot of Americans have like, are we really not doing anything like like Andrew Yang has to literally come in and swoop in to get you to think about cash relief given in the middle of a global pandemic where you're forcing people to stay home? Is that that's what it's taking? And my question for you is, is it there are really you've met a lot of the really great rational congressmen and women around the country. Um, is is Congress full of bad apples or is it one bad apple spoiling the whole bunch? You know, like what's the ratio of like good ones to bad ones and and what is the what's gumming what's gumming up the um the polarization there there are two parts of it zach like i think we've been very very helpful because we, we're uh the people's lobbyist uh and so you have to ask yourself who is incentivized to lobby for a certain thing uh and you can trace just about anything to some interest group somewhere but on, on this one there's no identifiable interest group <laughs> aside from all of us. Um, uh, and so like, that's the gap we, we've filled. Um, and if you're a member of Congress, your office gets peppered with meeting requests from various lobbyists and you, you meet with them and you know, the nature of the lobbyists you meet with varies depending upon what party you're in. Um, uh, and so that's where your policies tend to veer. Uh, and, and I'm thrilled that we can help. Uh, with this, but so there, there are two major structural problems. Number one is uh, you need a lobbyist. <laughs> um, yep. But the, the, the second is that the legislative rules have become really, really tough in terms of actually getting a law out the, the book, the, out the door and onto the books. So uh, there's something called the Hastert rule that got adopted a number of years ago, um, which is they will only consider a bill if the majority of the majority party approves it. Uh, So think about what that means if, let's say, you're a Republican Hmm. member of Congress. It means you can introduce literally zero legislation because you're not in the majority party. 
Uh, and then when the majority of the majority party introduces it, then they don't really expect you to vote for it because they're like, look, you know, we're going to have the votes. We're going to try and cram this. Uh, and, and then the review process isn't even real anymore where like, sometimes they'll be like, and here's legislation, give it like a vote. Yes or no. And then it's like, wait, I haven't read this thing and it's long. <laughs> and so, so you wind up with like, like a very, very polarizing dynamic. Uh, right. and, and so it's, it's these kinds of mechanics that I think people are not, uh, paying attention to properly. Of the things that have changed my life through <laughs> Yang Speaks, I'd have to say the Unagi scooter is either number one Agreed. or tied for number one. It's this freaking Tesla of electric scooters where you get it and you zip around. Um, it, it, it feels like a magic carpet. My kids are so envious because they're not big enough to ride it yet. Um, I don't know if this says something about my parenting, but uh, now uh, the older one I do stick on uh, the scooter in front of me and then I, I whiz around on it. Uh, but it makes you feel like you're in the future. It's environmentally friendly. You just plug it in. If you live in a city, it will transport you where you want to go, uh, you know, without having to, to struggle with, um, public transportation. Uh, it's beautiful. It's slick. Everyone looks at it and is like, what is that? That's the Unagi scooter for you. I can't speak highly enough about it. Uh, we got a second one, and then now when someone visits me, like the two of us go around, like we're in this really uh, futuristic scooter gang where we just like whiz around and uh, generally just have a blast. We even went out at night uh, because these things have these headlights um, that really make you seem like a UFO. Um, you know, it's like, uh, I don't know if you've done that, Zach. Have you done that? I've gone at night. Um, I, in, in New York, it is awesome to ride because it's faster than the bikes generally speaking, um, or the regular, the slow city bikes, um, and faster than runners. Uh, I, I love it. It's not that heavy either. It's like, it's like 25 pounds or so. Uh, I think 26 pounds, the exact weight, but it looks good. Folds up. It's beautiful. Um, you can basically have like 20 miles of range. Um, and they actually, this is fun because it's actually just won an award. CNET gave it best all around electric scooter. And then it won its first place for the best electric scooter by uh, Tom's Guide. So it's not just us starting to rave about this thing, it's real. Yes, and right now for a limited time, you can get $150 off for the holidays. This is the lowest price they will have for the next year. So check them out now, you will be glad, you will be grateful. This, <laughs> this thing's a real game changer. You can get yours today at unagiscooters.com. That's U-N-A-G-I scooters.com. So I've been reading this book, uh, Why We're Polarized by Ezra Klein, and it's this exhaustive treatment as to why we're polarized and why we can't get along. Uh, and it definitely informs what's going on in Congress uh, because you at this point have these two parties uh, warring with each other and neither side can win, so we all lose. You know, like uh, th there was a hope that Democrats would have a governing majority after this election and it doesn't look like that's happening. It's one reason I'm here in Georgia is uh, there's there's hope, um, but you have to win two Senate races uh, in January. Um, and uh, the cause of polarization are again around these incentives and these institutions. Uh, but the deepest stuff that Ezra unearths in this book that blew my mind and would blow the minds of I think most everyone listening to this, uh, two things. Number one, there is a weak correlation between self-identified conservatism and liberalism and your actual policy views. Uh, I want to say that again because I think it's so important. There is a weak correlation between whether I say I'm conservative or liberal or progressive and what I actually think on a whole variety of issues. If you're a math person, the correlation is 0.25 for both conservatives and liberals, uh, which is weak. A perfect correlation would be one. Uh, no correlation would be zero. So it's closer to no, no correlation than uh, being totally consistent. Uh, and that's going to surprise everyone listening to this. Uh, but it makes sense when you consider one basic fact that may not apply to you if you're listening to this. Most people don't know jack all about policy. <laughs> Where uh, if you say to them, like, hey, you liberal or conservative, they'll be like, conservative. 
And then you actually say like, hey, do you think drug prices are too high? They'll be like, oh yeah. Uh, you know, it's like, do you think government should do something about that? Yes. Um, you know, or you ask them about something they've never thought about, like Federal Reserve policy. Uh, you know, they'll, they'll just make something up or parrot whatever uh, the last thing they heard was. Um, and the vast majority of Americans don't have the time to become policy wonks on everything under the sun. Um, and so it, it turns out that the self-identification we have is more um, alignment with a tribe or a group or a political identity than it is actual uh, policy prescriptions. And so one of the things that we do very often, and, and I certainly do this, I'll still do it, whatever, even though Ezra has now convinced me that it probably is not the, the answer, is like you try and share information with people. Like say someone doesn't believe in climate change and then you're like, well, let me get you a study <laughs> or, or whatever. Like, like show them the, the, the study. Um, and, and this is the other finding he had, which was mind boggling, is that if you expose someone to information from the other perspective, it is more likely to harden their views than it is to change them. Uh, and, and so th this really articulates why we're struggling so badly right now where like you think that someone else is getting a whole different version of the world, which they kind of are sometimes. And then you're like, well, no, 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 no. Let me expose you to this article. Let me have you read this study. And they're more likely to double down on their current belief than they are to be convinced. Uh, so, so that, so that some of the things that, yeah, I know it's, it's like, it's a tough, there's some, there's some very tough pills to swallow in this book. So more facts means more polarization. Is that, I mean, that's a Zach's dumb way of paraphrasing that. Um, no, it, it's it's that uh, it's not an information gap the way that people believe. Um, it, it's more um, that people have established political identities and then they decide how they're going to react to a proposition based on that identity, not on the information that they have. Doesn't matter what you tell them. I'm a Red Sox fan. That's true. I'm a Buffalo Bills fan. Doesn't matter what you tell me how great Tom Brady is. He still sucks. Um, and I know he's great, but still sucks. Uh, that kind of like fandom situation. It's exactly like that. You have deflate gate or whatnot. And if you talk to a Patriots fan, they're like, whatever, who cares? Uh, and, and so th th this is one reason why uh, Trump commands such loyalty. And then people are like questioning, like, how the heck can you support this guy? Because he did X or he did Y. And it's like Tom Brady. Like, if that's your team, then you're like, whatever, who cares? You know, he can do what he wants. Um, uh, and you'll defend him. Uh, and if someone attacks him, then you actually, in some cases, uh, get more defensive. Like it, it doesn't open you up. It like closes you in various ways. So that, that's the reality according to really well documented studies. Like it, it's very compelling stuff, um, yeah. that, that politics has descended into teams um, and I think, Zach, for you, like you might understand this more naturally than others because you're a big sports fan. Um, I'm a big sports fan, too. So, like, uh, I get it. Um, and and so the, the blind spot a lot of folks have is that, again, they think it's an information gap. They think it's like, oh, if I can just get you this piece of information, then like the right. light bulb will turn on. Um, uh, and evidence indicates that that is not likely to work. You know, one place you can see the polarization as clear as day, Zach, is here in Georgia, because you cannot yeah. turn on the TV without seeing an ad from one party or the other. And I'm not going to give you um, my rendition of a David Perdue ad. Okay. Radical socialist John Ossoff wants to team up with radical liberals, AOC and Nancy Pelosi, to destroy Dung. America. Dung. Vote for David Perdue. A vote for David Perdue is a vote to save America. Vote for David Dung. Perdue to save America. I approve this I'm message. I'm the ominous music. David Dung. Perdue to save America. And Dung, 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 Dung. like, if you think that I'm exaggerating, like pull up one of these ads on the internet. Like, <laughs> You're not it, exaggerating. It, it, I've it, seen them. No, <laughs> it, it's, yeah, no, like, like literally, um, uh, like the words radical liberal and radical socialist every freaking five seconds. I mean, I don't know if you saw the Kelly Leffler it's debate. Dark it's dark red, like, the like they're the devil. Like they're the actual Lucifer incarnate. Um, 
That is. I not almost gonna... joked with John Ossoff when I saw him. I was like, "Hey, John, um, why do we have to defeat you to save America? Like, what is your plot to destroy <laughs> America? You know what I mean? Like, like that. But that that is literally like the level of uh, vitriol and fear, frankly, uh, that the Republican Party is leaning into to the tune of tens of millions of dollars here in Georgia, and it works. Frankly, I mean, like, you, you, they're not dumb. Like, they're going to bust out these ads. Um, these ads worked all over the country. You know, they're, they're pretty sure they're going to work here in Georgia, so they're leaning into them. You don't really need to make an affirmative case for yourself. Um, you can just try, just try and scare the shit out of people about the other person. That's another thing that popped up in Ezra Klein's book um, when it, it looked at motivators, political motivators. Uh, animosity toward the other team is actually a bigger political motivator than uh, excitement about your team. And that's true on both sides. Wow. Um, it, it, it's another reason why you're always seeing these inflammatory accusations and ads that are trashing the other side, because that actually drives voting behavior. It drives donations. It drives energy much, much more so than uh, talking about all the good you're going to do. Uh, and I mean, and, and that that's like an interesting phenomenon, given that, Zach, you, you and I know it's like we ran a campaign where we didn't really trash anyone. You know, we're just like, <laughs> like, like we're... we're we're just going to be positive and do our thing. Um, and it turns out that the numbers say that uh, trashing people works. That's a bad strategy. So, yeah. Hence, hence the ads that, that you know, I'm seeing here in Georgia every day. So, uh, so just wanted to share the on-the-ground experience here in Georgia, the, the joys of political advertising. Oh, my gosh. Um, this... I mean, I'm, I, so I have so many thoughts on this. One, I imagine social media fuels this. So I think we're heading that direction, but it gets exacerbated by our media. Oh, and, yeah, and for sure. Social, that sort of thing. A lot of people potentially listening to this actually think, and a lot of people who support you, Andrew, actually think you are one of the closest ways to solve for this because you're one of the, it takes a lot of people to run for office and a lot of people be successful at it. And you are one of the few at the, let's call it the top tier of, of politicians in the country that, quote unquote, politicians, um, that yeah, I don't like that, but <laughs> go that ahead. Isn't on the, on a, you're not on a team, you know? Um, and it's funny because, like, even you are, like, trying to get the Democrats to win. Uh, but there are things, you know, we have been very, very critical I'm doing it because I Democrats. think it's the right thing for the people, you know what I mean? Like, uh, like whoever, whoever wants to um, try and get our government working and get cash out of the door, like I'm, I'm going to be for. Um, yeah, that, so, so the, the, one of the big problems, if you believe what Ezra is arguing, which I generally do, um, that politics has become teams and tribal. Uh, and then you believe also that we're only allowed to have two teams. Uh, then you're in trouble, <laughs> you know, <laughs> because, um, because that is like, well, pick one of these two sides and, uh, let's make them of like, um, you know, relatively wow. even proportion. The sports uh, analogies, and, if like, if you had to pick between, it's like the Giants and the Jets. They both suck. I know the Giants are technically going to be a possible playoff team. First place, I'm New York kidding. Giants. <laughs> <laughs> uh, we like New York football. I mean, that's a bad example because I do like New York. But you like, you know, you've got it's two bad teams, if you will, and they're both equally bad in their own way. And you try to self justify to yourself what's better or worse. And um, uh, so I, I would say, day, I, I would say objectively, like I believe the Democratic Party is a better. Um, party than the Republican Party right now. Um, and I'm sorry, Republicans policy? are listening to this. Uh, yeah, and, in terms of policy, in terms of functionality, in terms of like actually trying to like listen to um, experts and you know like like folks like that. Like the the Republican Party has had some historic strengths, uh, and there are a lot of values of it that I appreciate, and a lot of other people appreciate, and I have many friends who are historic Republicans. Uh, but you have to say that Trump took over that party and and then has turned it into something that um, is different than it was not that long ago. And the clear the clearest sign of that is that the uh, Republican Party platform at the RNC uh, this past cycle was a, a was like a blank piece of paper. Whatever the Trump says, says is our platform, and we don't want to actually write anything down because then we're going to be exposed to hypocrisy after Trump says something different tomorrow. So, so that so that's like a you know I mean that that's not the Republican Party of yesteryear, that's for sure. Um, so one right. of the the dangers here, Zach, is like um, you know uh, you don't want to kind of um, uh, both sides this thing in like a particular way. 
um, because the parties are going through different things right now. And I certainly have my problems with the Democratic Party, for sure. I have many. Um, I have but, many. But, but, but they are, they're, they're, they're like a different set of problems for each party. It is tough trying to stay healthy during this pandemic. Uh, and one thing that helps me stay healthy and a lot of other people stay healthy right now is Freshly. What the heck is Freshly? They send you a fresh cooked meal. It's delicious. It's healthy. You don't have to do a whole heck of a lot at all. It's like, you know, when you're in those grocery stores and then you see that like rotisserie chicken meal in the in the container and you're like, ooh, and you know, you just like get that thing and you bring it home and eat it up and it, it's good. It's like that. It's essentially those meals that get sent to you. Uh, I know you're like, wow, that sounds pretty fantastic. And you're not the only one who thinks so because one and a half million satisfied Freshly users do the exact same thing. They skip the shopping, prepping, cooking, and cleaning. They just focus on the eating and the healthy living. So for a limited time, Freshly is offering our listeners $40 off their first two orders at Freshly.com slash Yang. That's Freshly.com slash Yang. Feed your body right. Just get some freaking Freshly in there. Tons of people are using this. Join in, skip the shopping, prepping, cooking, cleanup. Freshly.com slash Yang. I love this thing. I'm ordering here in Jacksonville too. It's great. Regardless of how you feel about either party though, I think you'd have to say that if you are uh, this polarized and having two teams is very problematic because then you, you just split power, nothing gets done, your legislative incentives are uh, more tied to blaming the other side than um, improving people's lives. I mean, that, 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 so that, that's why we're also uh, disheartened. Uh, and you have these structural forces that are, that are making it so. So then the obvious question is like, how do you change this? Um, and I, I think this is gonna be something I talked to um, our guest today, Ryan Knight about, um, but to me, the, the answer is mechanical, which I know is going to be like mechanical, but if, if you listen to this and say, look, you know, uh, it's not about necessarily, um, uh, trying to get people a particular piece of info, uh, and Yang Gang, like we should keep doing what we're doing. Like it does work on, uh, on a lot of folks who just haven't seen our ideas, and like I do it every day, so I don't want to discourage us from like you know actually reaching people who can be um, convinced. Um, but uh, to me, the answer has to be rank choice voting or something that actually enables you to to have a different, less bilateral us or them dynamic, um, uh, and and also enables you to put to bed this entire you're going to waste your vote thing that so many people get whenever they are thinking about voting third party. Um, then, you know, you, you're immediately an idiot if you vote for anything that's not one of the two major parties. Um, and that's a mechanical problem. If you have ranked choice voting, then you're perfectly smart to vote, <laughs> to vote for whoever you want. Uh, and uh, so that to me is the great change that can actually shift the dynamic um, and uh, break up the us versus them polarization. In the presidential primary, we were the most liked candidate, but... Um, finished around seventh or so in, in total votes. If ranked choice voting existed, uh, we can all honestly say, I think Andrew would have finished top five, possibly top three um, in a polarized environment. So that's like the kind of, uh, because people, a lot of people didn't want to vote for Andrew um, because he wasn't a front runner. And like, well, if I don't want to, I don't want, so and I don't want Bernie to win. I don't want whoever. Um, so I don't want to waste my vote, right? Yeah, the, and so the, the current system does reward folks who continuously make electability like their, their main thing, which ends up rewarding folks who have more resources, which tends to reward uh, folks who are closer to the money pot. So, so there, are, there are like a lot of advantages um, to making this change. And there are 26 states that have ballot initiatives uh, that would enable you to get ranked choice voting uh, for your state's elections. Um, so you can see what, what, whether, uh, that's your state. So you're writing a book, which is, um, I think you've been public about that a couple of times in the pod about what we're writing about and trying to dive into this, um, which I love cause you're doing research and then you come up with these crazy ideas in the pod or, or good ideas in the pod. Um, have you looked into other countries, um, 
that no, that's they have other, that ranked choice voting. But I know in in various European countries they have other parties um, and how that's played out because they still have the fandom piece, but they have more options. Yeah, it's actually unusual to only have two major parties. Uh, if you look around the world, most parliaments have multiple parties, and then you have different parties having to get together uh, to get a law passed. Um, so we're unusual in that in in our degree of polarization. And there are a lot of ways in which the duopoly has been fixed in place um, where, where the, these party mechanics and the parties control just about everything. Um, and, and there was a quote from Boss Tweed, uh, who used to run New York, that I, I liked. It said, you can do the electing if I can do the nominating. Uh, and that's really like the system we have right now where, you know, like, like the party controls the primary. You have like a subset of folks who can... Um, influence that and then by the time it gets to the general like people looking up being like what are my choices like what's going on so if you have uh, open primaries ranked choice voting uh final five candidates um make it to the general uh and then you have like a real diversity of perspectives you can have uh, like a, a genuine third party emerge uh like that that to me is the answer um and you know i'm excited about trying to share what got me here um uh in the days ahead um, but yeah, it's been fun working on this, Zach, because like, I always want to learn. Uh, it's one reason I, I love the podcast is that we bring on people I can learn from um, and uh, try and get some ideas out there that will actually help solve the real problems. And, and I'm now convinced. I used to think that the problem was that not enough people knew about universal basic income, uh, which you is too. still a problem. But now and the majority of but now and automation. Like yeah, changing. but now but now the majority of Americans are for universal basic income, um, but we still can't get cash relief as, uh, as part of the, you know, like pandemic yeah. relief. And so I'm like, okay, what the hell's going on now? And then you get there and be like, oh, it's because Congress is dysfunctional for various reasons. And our political system is dysfunctional for various reasons. <laughs> and so now, so now my attention's turned towards that. And it's fun too, because like we're going into the, you know, we're advancing. I mean, we're making progress. And then you learn, like, could I have known this stuff before um, all of the experiences of this last number of, uh, of months and years? Like, heck no. Um, so, but now I know. Um, and so hopefully now that we know more, we can do something about it. It's, I think one of my takeaways from running Andrew is that the parties, so it's like, uh, one of my things I'm, I've been researching and talking about a bit is that the, the traditional gatekeepers are dying, um, but they're not dead. So these parties, our political parties are weak in a lot of ways, but they're not they're not gone yet, if you will. And that we did a lot, like, and we are proof that they are weak and that we came out of nowhere, um, wielded the internet and the people. But we're also um, proof that they're still strong. <laughs> yes, but we're also proof that they're, they're that we weren't good, we weren't strong enough, right? Um, Trump yeah. played um, more aggressive populism um, than we than you are. You're more pa like a rational populist, but he was, a, exactly he was above them. Is These are just two different landscapes. Like the Republican yeah. landscape is much less uh institution bound whereas the democratic landscape is very tied up with institutions Correct. and the media your for trump and it's fine like any you talk to any republican friend if you have them and even myself self my own family like traditionally like republican it is an asset to not be of the government that is a plus that is a check in the plus column or like I'm, I'm not a politician i'm an outsider trying to fix things like great you know how to run a real organization awesome democrats Every time we polled, like, I'm an outsider, I'm, you know, I'm not a traditional politician, it did not poll that well. If you look at trust in media generally, it's 40% uh, general population, 20% Republicans, 60-something percent Democrats. So, so Democrats, Damn. yeah, so Democrats, like, trust the media, trust institutions, yep. and then if you show up and you're like, hey, we should do something different, they're like, should we? It, it's really interesting. It's like Democrats, in some ways, they are kind of, like, change-resistant, um, because they're more institutional, <laughs> you know what I mean? And, uh, and, and re Republicans, um, don't believe the media as much. And so they don't care what the media is saying and whatnot. And, you know, so like, so Trump could just override the whole thing. Um, but in the, in a democratic primary, it's a lot tougher. And you and I ran that gauntlet, you know, like, I, I mean, I remember vividly, I'd show up to things and these reporters, um, would want nothing to do with us. And then if they did talk to us, they, they would do it in a way that was like, get a load of this guy, you know, like, and, and it, it was, and like it, it changed, um, month to month. So by the end it was better. 
Um, but still, the biggest outpouring of press we got uh, was when I dropped out. <laughs> <You know? laughs> yep. There was like this. You weren't a threat anymore. Yeah, there was like this giant like build up, and then it's like, and yeah, that guy was actually talking sense. So then I'm like, thank God uh, he well, ran. So they are different media landscapes. Uh, they do, there's a much different level of institutional trust. And one of my real fears for the Democratic Party is that they will be the last people saying it's okay, calm down, these institutions are working, and then the rest of America will be like, fuck you. <laughs> <That> <laughs> you know? Like, yeah. like that's like that is the great fear, uh, and. Uh, you know, and, and so my recipe at the time was, okay, get a hold of government, then do big things and like try and demonstrate that it can work. Uh, and then the fact that that does not seem like it's likely given, you know, the current division of government, the lack of uh, like a wave and the rest of it. Like now I'm just, I've got this like foreboding, oh no, uh, because the, the mistrust is just going to keep rising. Um, and, uh, you know, like our institutions are frankly like, you know, going to perform worse, not better, uh, generally. I mean, do I think democratic leadership will upgrade some of the um, government response to COVID and some other things? Heck yes, it will. Like, you know, like, like they're not going to be as incoherent and unconcerned uh, as the Trump administration. Like, you know, like that's real. Uh, that's, you know, it's one reason why I'm very, very glad that it's happening. Um, but if you look at like the general landscape, it's like our institutions getting uh, better, smarter, more effective, more efficient. It's like, eh, it's tough to say, you know, like, like to the extent that, uh, that there are things that are going forward in leaps and bounds. Unfortunately, uh, it, it, it's primarily technology, various commercial enterprises, like the, these, uh, startups that now, like, you know, if you need anything delivered to your door, it'll just freaking magically show up because like they got hundreds of millions of dollars to invest in, uh, you know, now, I mean, DoorDash just had an IPO. Like, I was looking at their valuation. And they like, did well, didn't millions. it? Yeah, it, it, it popped because it's common sense. You're all looking around and being like, huh, in the future or the present, do we need DoorDash? And everyone's like, heck yes. Yeah. <laughs> you know what I mean? Well, here's so a fun it, yeah. one for you. Here's a fun one. That's right, on to put, right on point what you're saying is that in Washington, D.C., now I get it, it's a city, um, but that in this race... 92% of Washington, D.C. people who live there voted for Biden. So it was literally nine and only 5%. There are 5% of voters in that in Washington, D.C. that are Republican. And to me, like that, like obviously the cities, it's usually on the high end, like 70, 70, 30, kind of 80, 20 in that range. But for that high in that population, to me, is like just a perfect example of like, oh, no, the people that like run the institutions and still believe in them are all going to go Democrat, if you will. You put any Democrat on there and you have a very similar thing, a lot more. You know, there's some anti-Trump there, too. But um, and that is the problem with Democrats, where we believe in failed systems over and over and over. It's one reason why a lot of Republicans liked me is because they sensed that I am a human being. I'm an individual. Uh, and like, I, I'm not of the institution and they're like, Ooh, like I, I kind of <laughs> like, Ooh, I kind of like this guy's vibe. Um, uh, and, uh, you know, and, and I appreciate that. Uh, you know, like I, I'm, I'm working on something, um, a around, uh, the mistrust. Um, and, and a lot of it is well-founded, frankly. And, and there's this like incredible, um, failure to acknowledge it on the part of a lot of our institutions themselves and like the media organs and whatnot, where, um, you know, when there's institutional failure, there's just like uh, nothing to see here. Like, you know, keep it moving. Like it could be like the media organization itself having a problem. And it's like nothing to see here. <laughs> like, like the... You know, it's been hard and it's been different for us this time around, but to help to still see why so many people voted for Donald Trump given the environment we are in you know what i'm saying given that there's a pandemic you could argue something like nine million handled. more people 10 million more people voted for trump like you know right. I, when i checked the, the end of the election it was like 68 million now it's like 74 million as the votes continue to come right. in and that should be the problem for democrats is like we think we're good we think we're right and i think we are like from a moral standpoint or even like ideas standpoint but as a party we are doing things and saying things and being hypocritical, how many freaking 
Democratic mayors or governors are saying, yo, lock down, but then they're going to private dinners themselves. Like that, stuff like that is where Republicans get so, so angry. And it's like, I'd rather throw the Donald Trump in there and blow it up than, you know, stand for that kind of um, bad ideas, if you will. Uh, it, it's the fact that we have these two parties and um, not, you know, not that much else to choose from. Uh, so I'm excited to talk to Ryan Knight uh, you know, his social media handle says it all, a proud socialist <laughs> about uh, what he sees. Because, like, you know, he um, criticizes the Democratic Party um, uh, as being out of touch very consistently and regularly. So excited to sit down with him um, and find out his views on what we can do better. I'm I'm so curious about this conversation because, and I hope we get to, you know, talk about this, that Socialism, in it's the way it's defined, where government seizing means of production, has not worked. There's no example of it anywhere that it has worked. But there are elements of socialism that have worked great, whether it's healthcare or education or, I mean, Canada is a decent example. And uh, most of the Norwegian countries are solid examples. So I think Democrats aren't the best at messaging. We kind of tend to throw the baby out with the bathwater or vice versa when we when we talk about some big ideas. But so this I'm, I'm excited to hear you talk to a socialist because you're not a socialist, but some of your policies are aligned with the, the visions of socialism in many ways. So I think that's really exciting. So Ryan Knight joining Yang Speaks. Let's do it. Here at Yang Speaks, we're all about fighting for your data, for our data. Uh, we have a data dividend project trying to make it so that the interests of the people get represented at, in state houses around the country. We won Prop 24, which is making data rights a real thing in California. Thank you to everyone who supported Prop 24. But in the meantime, if you're not in California and you want to have your data be anonymous, truly anonymous, we recommend that you use ExpressVPN. VPN's a virtual private network, and ExpressVPN is rated number one by CNET and Wired. All these big companies use it. It's like a portal to the internet anonymously through some server someplace else. You can do whatever you want. You can get content from other countries. Uh, we, we, Missouri, whatever. And no, I'm kidding. I don't know why I thought of France just then. So stop handing over your personal data to the big tech companies that frankly do monitor your activity. Sometimes they even sell it. Protect yourself with a VPN that we trust here at Yang Speak to, to stay safe online. Visit expressvpn.com slash yang. That's E-X-P-R-E-S-S vpn.com slash yang to get three extra months for free. Go to expressvpn.com slash yang to learn more. It is my pleasure to welcome to Yang Speaks, activist, the host of the Amped Up podcast, and advisor to the Movement for a People's Party, proud socialist himself, Ryan Knight. Welcome, Ryan. Thank you so much, uh, Andrew. I am looking forward to this conversation, and thank you for all the work you're doing uh, to make sure that families uh, get the cash relief that they desperately need right now during this pandemic. Oh, yeah. We, we're pushing Congress every day. I had several calls just today. Um, it's been fun prodding legislators, and certainly I am thrilled that they will spend time with me, uh, you know, that I have like a stature where um, a call with Andrew Yang on their calendar is not like, oh, no, what did my staff do? <laughs> like they turn around and like berate someone. Um, so uh, so that's, that's front and center. Um, I want to give people a sense of your... Uh, progression, because you've been through a lot uh, as an activist, you've done a lot of different things. Um, but I love your origin story on a personal level where you bounced back between Seattle and Alaska, like your dad was a commercial fisherman. So you went from red to blue to red to blue to red to blue on the regular when you were growing up. Is that right? Yeah. So I, uh, my, my family divorced when I was very young, when I was two. And uh, my father moved to Alaska to become a commercial fisherman in a little town called Petersburg, Alaska. And my mom uh, stayed in Seattle. Uh, and so I kind of had, you know, I had this childhood where I went from, you know, the city life from a you know, big liberal city like Seattle, where I went to school. 
Uh, to in the summers and, and during Christmas time, I would go up to a little to Alaska, which is you know to a little small fishing village called Petersburg, which is you know a, the country life and and you know definitely a red state and definitely you know a town of Trump supporters. And so, you know, in my childhood, I kind of got to see both views. Uh, I kinda, I got to see you know what it was like for more rural communities and and what it's like living in in a big city, which I think gives you gave me kind of a unique perspective on politics. That you know it doesn't matter. You know, if, you, if you're from that small, you know, rural town or if you're in the big city, I think that, you know, everyday working class people are, you know, they just want to have the same opportunities as, as everyone else. Yep. And it feels like, especially now in this climate, you know, over the last decade, that it's become harder and harder in America for the working class, you know, while the rich just keep getting richer and richer. That's great exposure for you. If you were a Netflix movie character, you definitely would have fallen in love during one of the Alaska summers. It would have been one of those situations, you know what I mean? Yeah. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I've had some, some some many great Alaska summers just with those beautiful sunsets. And it's it stays light in Alaska for like 18 hours, you know, um, during the summer. In the summer. Uh, so we would play glorious. baseball like on the mud flats. And, you know, it was definitely an interesting, it was it was interesting. And then, of course, you know, I, I, I am gay. And so that was all entering that into the equation was also very interesting because so you go up there it was like like, a whole new curveball for my my fish my father who's a lifelong conservative and um you know and that was a whole added a whole new perspective to it but uh you know today my family my father and i are have a great relationship and it wasn't always that way so i'm i'm so grateful for that and i'm so grateful that we both see each other and respect each other and and learn from each other you know i learned so much from my dad uh just as he has learned a lot from me and you know there was a period of about a decade where we didn't speak and so oh um, wow well i'm so yeah. glad you guys have a have a, a great relationship now uh, so you then went to college in california and then you worked in corporate finance uh for a number of years and that was um also on the west coast is that right yeah I, so I, I went to santa Clara university in the bay area uh and i graduated and i worked in the silicon valley at a startup company uh that did business valuations of other startup, other smaller companies. And That's it was right meta. after the dot-com boom. <laughs> yeah, it was right after the dot-com boom. So there was just a lot of, you know, activity happening. And, and, and it, you know, it was, a, it, was a, it was a hard economy coming out of school. But, uh, you know, after like six years of corporate finance, it was, it was suffocating. You know, it wasn't for me. And, and uh, you know, I, I realized after that that I needed to do something where I was making a difference. And so I got involved in politics uh, on a local level. Um, and I, I worked for the mayor of West Hollywood for a long time, uh, John Duran, and I helped him get elected. Uh, and then I also worked for another prominent uh, politician uh, in kind of the Los Angeles area. Uh, and then after Trump happened, I realized, you know, that I needed to kind of get involved in a bigger way. And uh, I helped a grassroots PAC uh, in 2018 uh, called Build the Wave that did, you know, flipped about 40 seats in the House from, from red to blue. And then after that, I kind of realized that, like, you know, establishment politics, you know, while they have a lot of good intentions, um, that we needed more than kind of what the establishment was offering. You know, that just, you know, going on television and sedating the public with these lofty platitudes of hope and change isn't enough if you're not going to back it up with actual policies that are going to improve people's lives and move this country forward. You know, policies like Medicare for All and a Green New Deal and universal basic income that you have been a huge advocate for. You know, it's, it's, I, I kind of started to realize that, like, you know, a, a man much wiser than me one, by the name of Albert Einstein once said that we can't solve <laughs> our problems with the same level of, of consciousness or thought that created the problems. You know, and for, and for a half century now in Washington, D.C., you know, both corporate parties have been governing for Wall Street and uh, giant corporations and the ruling class, and they haven't been governing for the people. There, there's a, there is a, a real shift, and you can see it in the numbers, where the economy starts diverging uh, around the 70s, as you say. So it's been about 50 years. Certainly a lot of it sped up during the Reagan era. Um, but you see this very steep divergence between returns on capital and returns on labor, uh, between um, increases in, in compensation and various costs where like our standard of living uh, should be much higher. But, uh, you know, I mean, I can't believe how comp hasn't moved in real terms 
since then, even though we've gotten much, much wealthier. And, and I think that a lot of folks essentially pretend like it's still the 70s, you know, like our economic uh, understanding is uh, cast in this nonsense, <laughs> like frozen portrait of like a 70s economy where, hey, if I get this money and I'm a company, then I'll turn around and like hire lots of workers and I'll treat them well and I'll give them benefits and I'll care about what goes on in my backyard. And companies just stopped doing that decades ago. Uh, and we just pretend that they still operate that way. Yeah, you know, and I would say like, look, maybe like right after Trump got elected, I thought that, you know, I kind of initially thought, well, gosh, you know, like that he's the problem. But as I did more research and kind of started to unpack our political system, I quickly realized that, you know, America isn't failing because of one corrupt president. America nope. is failing because our entire system is corrupt. You know, for the last 40 years, we've had failed trickle-down economics for the working class. Yep. And we've That's had, true. you know, massive bailouts, subsidies, tax breaks, and, and, and corporate socialism, you know, for Wall Street and the ruling class. And, and it's created this society that we live in. Like, look, in some, yeah, we are the richest nation in the history of the world, but we don't even have universal health care. You know, we're the richest nation in the history of the world, but we don't have universal child care or, you know, universal public college or universal basic income. And so we have all this wealth that has just been concentrated more and more into the hands of the 1%. Heck, man, we don't even have clean water for a lot of people, you know? There's like a lot of basic stuff. We don't even have clean water in some communities. And so it's, it's, about, yeah. it's about equity. It's about fairness. It's about having a government that is on our side, right? Like... And, and also, I think what's, what's, what's been very noticeable in this moment is like, and I think it, you can look back in 2008 after the financial crisis, right? What did our government do after the financial crisis? They didn't bail four out. $4 trillion you know, bailout of Wall Street. Yeah, right. the $4 trillion. Like just they shoveling didn't bail it over. out our small businesses <laughs> and, our, and our mom and pop shops. They, they bailed out Wall Street and giant corporations, the very people who caused the crisis. You know, and, uh, The and, crucial decision at that point, Ryan, was you could have bailed out homeowners if you wanted to. You could have made yeah, a lot and, of the mortgage debt that was forcing people out of their homes. Yeah, and we saw 10 million Americans lose their homes. But I think the same way our government... You know, just after the financial crisis, they went and they, they did what they do best, you know, bailed out their corporate donors. We saw the same thing happen during this pandemic, right? With the, you know, and they called it the CARES Act. Well, it had a lot of care for the billionaire class, but it didn't have enough care for, for small businesses and, and the working class. And since the CARES Act was passed, you know, in February and March, we've seen, you know, U.S. billionaires increase their wealth by a trillion dollars. Uh, you know, while working people can barely keep their heads above water. People got that $1,200 in the CARES Act. And so you think, okay, like that, then that money must have been for us, right? Uh, but if you do the math, if you have a $2.2 trillion act, which you do, uh, and you send $1,200 out to, let's be aggressive and say a couple hundred million people, you're looking at about 10% of that act was money for the people. Uh, so don't get it messed up, people, where it's like, oh, well, you know, 2.2 trillion came to us. No, no, no. <laughs> right. <laughs> yeah, like the vast majority of that went to big corporates. Yeah, and, and look at the, and the consequences have been startling. I mean, here we are, the richest nation on earth, and, and Feeding America, which is one of the biggest, you know, food banks in our country, has now reported that we're going to see 50 million people face food, you know, food insecurity this year. And we have 40 million Americans who are, uh, are facing eviction with the moratorium set to expire at the end of this month. And so, you know, it just, it doesn't have to be this way. You know, this many people shouldn't be struggling. And I think that's the We could the choose to do better immediately. We can't, yeah. we can demand better. You know, and I look at someone like the Democratic Party. Look, like, I've been a Democrat for 18 years. I'm a lifelong Democrat. But finally, like, this last, you know, year and a half, my eyes kind of opened up and I saw that, like, look, I've never voted for a Republican in my life. I don't support the Republican Party. But, you know, the Republican Party isn't also, they're a little more transparent. They're not saying that, you know, climate change is real. And they're not saying that health care is a human right. You know, they're not kind of making these promises and spouting wow. these platitudes. Whereas There's you've some got rough these, stuff, Ryan. Right. But you've got these Democrats, you know, like Joe Biden or Nancy Pelosi, who will go on CNN and they'll say climate change is real. But then they won't support the policy, like a Green New Deal, to do something about it. So pumped that we have a new sponsor here. I want to talk to you guys about Hawthorne, which we found, and it is 
I've never been excited to take a shower and use a body wash before. That's kind of what I feel. So here's what happened. So a lot of our ads, we do like these tailored, uh, we love quizzes apparently. So you take this quiz online and it's random from like, what type, hey, what, what is your priorities when it comes to deodorant? Do you want antiperspirant? Do you sweat a lot? Do you just want it for smell? That sort of thing. What are your priorities for a body wash? Do you want it to smell good? Do you want to scrub dirt? Like whatever your preferences are. And that goes from lotion to hand soap to face soap to all these different uh, conditioner, all these things, your hair, your body, your skin, all these things. And then they send you a custom version of um, all of these, whatever one you pick. And honestly, I love it. I have been trying all of their products. Even I'm like a stickler on a certain types of deodorant. I even like their deodorant. Um, so if you want to upgrade your self-care routine, Hellathern is like this fun, convenient way to get extremely high quality products tailored just for you, which is very cool. It is fun how now there are more and more tailored personal products for guys you know i grew up in a time when it was just like one thing speed stick <laughs> yeah irish spring bar of soap oh that, yeah that was the good stuff years. man like clean as a whistle <laughs> uh, but now you have like legit self-care that's tailored to you because not every guy is alike you know we actually have different um skin different hair different grooming needs and the rest of it uh, pretty much anything Zach says to do in this area, you should definitely do. Have you seen Zach? He, he's a very, very well-groomed gentleman. Um, you know, uh, well, being around him on the trail. I actually care. But... <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> right around the trail, he was always shaming us with his hair and his face. All right. And his facial hair. <laughs> <laughs> I hate this ad now. Just kidding. I do. I really do like Hawthorne. Go to hawthorne.co and use promo code YANG to get 10% off your first purchase. That's H-A-W-T-H-O-R-N-E dot co, promo code YANG. Hawthorne.co, promo code YANG. We left it off where Trump gets elected and you turn your attention to like, okay, and then you help with the PAC in 2018. Um, and then at some point you had kind of like this political awakening you're describing. So I wanted you to walk folks through what you were doing 2018, where you were in 2020, and then when, what pushed you to a point where now you're like, okay, I'm not even a Democrat anymore. I'm, I'm going to go um, full socialist. I think for me is, you know, in 2018, it was like vote blue, no matter who, you know, just yep. blue wave. Let's just flip the house and everything will be yeah. better now. And, and you're doing the work. Yeah. And, and we did the work and, and we flipped the house. And my big epiphany, again, it was that Democrats make these promises. You know, they sedate us with these great platitudes that, yes, yeah, climate change is real. But that's not enough. You know, when we have a climate crisis bearing down on our communities, it's not enough to just identify the problem. You have to support legislation and a policy to actually do something about the problem. 2020, you started out in the Warren camp. Is that right? I initially backed Warren for about, you know, maybe I think it was five months uh, in 2019. And then right after Iowa, when it was very clear that Warren did not have a path to the White House. And it was also very clear that this moment in history demanded... You came out for Yang. No, I'm kidding. I'm kidding. <laughs> <laughs> but I, you were, you, I'll tell you, you came on my radar shortly thereafter. I, I mean, you've definitely been on my radar. But uh, And I also think we need to talk about the corporate media component, because I think the reason you weren't on as many people's radars is because of just the way our corporate media covers our politics. And there's been some very interesting reporting that, you know, candidates that were fighting back against the status quo and actually fighting for policies that challenge the status quo, candidates like yourself and Tulsi Gabbard and even Bernie, you know, ever since 2016, they, they, they don't really cover those candidates and they tend to stick I noticed, with the candidates. Ryan, I noticed that I wasn't quite getting the same coverage as some other folks. Uh, yeah, and they, <laughs> they, tend to, they tend to favor the candidates who just kind of want to keep everything business as usual and won't disrupt the status quo. And that would maybe be fine if the status quo was working for the majority of Americans. But we live in a moment in history where it's not. Your, hit at, your critique hits on something very fundamental, which is like the Democratic Party do... Uh, un uh, unfortunately, take on this role of the status quo party, sort of. It's like, look, it's like they're like the business as usual party, uh, and, and and business. But as don't usual say has that not been because if, if you if you criticize them or challenge, not even like after 2018, I wasn't as vocal as I am now. I would just basically say, look, vote blue no matter who isn't enough because it's like how how is a party ever going to get better 
if you're just going to hand them your vote and tell them that they don't have to do anything to get that vote? What incentive do you give them if you just say, well, we're going to vote for you no matter what you do, right? Because you're not giving them actually an incentive to work for the people. You're not demanding something in return for your vote. And this is where you've landed now, I know, because now you think the problem is the duopoly. Because one of the things the Democratic Party can do very powerfully is like, you got to vote for me because are you really going to help that guy win? Uh, you know, right. and, and so then if you're like a sane progressive, you're like, oh, snap, like, I really don't want that guy to win. So they got they got a point there. <laughs> no, abs you're absolutely right. And, and I think also, like, as long as progressives have nowhere to go, as long as there's not a major viable third party option to challenge the duopoly, which we don't have now. We have smaller parties that have been trying. You know, the Green Party has tried for the past three three to four decades to break through the duopoly, uh, and they haven't seen much success. And again, there's it, it's because, you know, look, these two corporate parties have been building this power for a long time now. You know, this this didn't all just start with Donald Trump when he, when he became president, and it's not going to end now that he's no longer president. Again, you know, these parties have been governing this way and putting their corporate donors over the basic needs of the people for a very, very, very long time. And I think that, look, I think that each party does it. You know, they're both guilty of it. I think, and I think that, you know, you go, you, if you, for instance, if you turn on CNN, you know, or MSNBC, most of the pundits on there will basically say that, you know, that Republicans, they're the problem and Trump is the problem. And then if you turn on Fox News, you know, it'll, the pundits will basically tell you that, no, it's those Democrats are the problem and it's Nancy Pelosi's the problem. And so if you can divide the 99% and you can keep, you know, the red team versus the blue team, you know, the 99% so busy fighting, we're so busy fighting each other that we don't notice that these corrupt politicians in Washington are busy rigging the system against us and rigging the system for the 1%. You know, and that's really, to me, kind of the crux of the issue that, there's so much, you know, that the American people are so blinded by political partisanship that they don't see that neither of these corporate parties, in essence, truly works for the people. Look at this year, like the, the proof is in the pudding. Wall Street in 2020 gave more money to Joe Biden and the Democrats than they did to Donald Trump and the Republicans. I'm unsurprised just in that, you know, I, I think Joe's going to be like a better steward of the economy um, and, and people on... Uh, you know, like uh, on the boards of these companies, we're getting tired of the unpredictability of Trump, I think. But to your fundamental critique that uh, the duopoly is a problem and partisanship is distracting us from solving the real problems, uh, let's say I agree, which I do. Um, so, and I love the way your mind works. Like you've gone through a progression that um, I've gone through a version of in my own way. I think there are different people who've gone through a version of it. Um, but I, I do want to just beat the step a little bit more for the folks who right now are still vote blue no matter who, um, the way you were a number of years ago, not that long ago, it sounds like. Two, two years um, ago. <laughs> yeah, yeah, like two, two years literally, ago. Literally, no, two years ago, I was literally helping more establishment Democrats get elected. So I just want to trace those steps because I think it's really important. So you're helping establishment Democrats get elected. You support Bernie in 16, uh, as I did. I, when I heard Bernie for the first time kind of really identify the campaign finance issues and that, you know, both yeah. parties were taking money from giant corporations in Wall Street and, you know, yeah. governing for the ruling <laughs> class and not governing for I the working the, class. I had the same experience, Ryan, where like I listened to a Bernie speech in uh, 15 or 16 and I was like, I agree with every word that man just said. But I also think is what's important in my evolution is like, although I voted for Bernie in 2016, Right after, I, I was a good little Democrat, you know, and I got right on the Hillary. I jumped right on the Hillary train Hillary after the primary. I voted for Hillary in the general, for sure. And I voted yep. for Hillary. But I think that one of the messages that the corporate media, again, that has such an influence on our politics, it was kind of, their message was, well, Bernie is addressing these kind of core fundamental issues with our government and in our economy where, you know, the rich, again, keep getting richer and richer and the poor keep getting poorer and poorer and just the unsustainable nature of an economy that continues to prop up the, the ruling class and, and at the extent and take and take advantage of and take for granted the working class and and that this the working class has, has been carrying this nation on its back for the last 50 years uh, and not seeing, you know, uh, increased. Oh, especially the uh, first number of months with COVID. I mean, the working class has really been carrying us all, all around. Yeah. So so the message I took after he lost, it was like the court was like, great job, Bernie. But like that was unrealistic. You know, it was like, you know, everyone in this country having health care, just unrealistic. And, you know, it was like, but, you, but go for you, Bernie. And they kind of gave him a pat on the back. And then it was like, 
I kind of went back to sleep after that. I was a little upset. And then I was like, well, you know, I'll just, you know, I've been a Democrat for so long and I supported Hillary. And, I, and so I kind of just got back. And, and then after Hillary lost, I, I think this is important. After Hillary lost, the DNC and Hillary's campaign, they did a good PR job of kind of blaming everyone else but themselves for the reason that they lost. You know, they blamed yep. Russia. They blamed, you know, they blamed the Bur- they blamed the Bernie Bros. They blamed Jill Stein. They me. blamed the Green Party. They blamed everyone else, but actually the fact that this kind of milquetoast neoliberal politics that the the Democratic establishment uh, campaigns on and governs with, it, it's kind of been leaving out the working class. The most damning thing I thought they said after the fact was. Uh, and, you know, I imagine she would, would not want to repeat this. Maybe she would, or the Democrats might be repeating this even now. I don't know. Um, but she said, well, I, I won the areas that, uh, that accounted for the vast majority of the economy and economic growth. Um, right. And I was like, what the hell is the point of that? Where it's yeah. like, <laughs> where, where, where it's like, where like the places where your economy is not growing as much don't matter as much because the people there what like like that that could like that statement um i thought was one of the worst uh like kind of post mortem comments about why they lost because um it you know it, it sort of suggested that like well like these people are not like you know people that um we should be valuing their votes the same way well absolutely and i think that you know Part of the reason I am, I've been so inspired in the progressive movement is that, you know, the progressive movement is, is, about, is about policies that deliver dignity and justice for everyone. You know, progressive policies don't leave anyone out or any economies behind or in any states so, so this behind. Is, so this is 2017. The postmortem turns you off in a particular way. Well, uh, so then actually, what no. I, I, initially, I fell for their postmortem. That's what I'm saying. Like, initially, I was like, I got kind of sucked into like, yeah, you know, I, I, even though I voted for Bernie in, 20, in the primary, I kind of got sucked into the establishment narrative for the first six months. And, and look, the, the, the liberal media is very powerful. And the Democratic establishment is really good at kind of crafting these narratives and also kind of pandering. And, you know, I, look, I'm a member of the LGBTQ community. They do a great job of pandering to our community. But do they are they truly representing our community when they're not supporting universal health care, you know, and they're not actually supporting policies that help, you know, LGBTQ people at the margins. And so, again, I was still kind of falling for the platitudes for, you know, I was a big Obama guy, you know, the hope and change. But my, so my real epiphany didn't happen until after we flipped the house and we made the house blue. And then it was like Trump was clearly committing a few impeachable offenses. And Pelosi, it was like we had to beg her to impeach him. It was like we had to beg her for about six months just for her to do her job. You know, after the Mueller report was released and it was clear that he obstructed justice, Pelosi didn't want to take any action. It wasn't until after that summer when the Ukraine thing happened and after months and months of pressure from activist groups, and I was one of the people that was pressuring Pelosi hard back then, that she finally did it and she kind of impeached him on his more lesser offenses. So what I kind of saw after the Democrats took the House too, and, and the other part is even though I was working for this PAC that was, there were some progressives that we supported in the PAC, but it wasn't necessarily the candidates that I would pick now. You know, the candidates that I would, that, you know, now it's like, if you don't support Medicare for all and a Green New Deal and UBI, like, I'm probably not going to support your campaign. So you, you become more uh, um, extreme, I suppose. And I don't mean that as a bad thing at all, because the things you're Yeah, you could say a little you know, bit more are, progressive or radical, you know, but right, radical, you know, sure. radical compassion. I, I, so, you know, like, I, I'm... Uh, in agreement on like the the policy prescriptions you're 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 describing you know with with like some um, caveats I would say too on my side um, I you know I was pro impeachment when it was happening but I I thought I was like this is going to be such a fiasco because it's just going to consume all their energies they're not going to get it he's going to claim exoneration like uh, like the whole thing I mean should they do it you know when it was happening I was like sure um, but I I did think that it was not solving the problems of the American people, you know, and at that time I was campaigning, 
Absolutely. Um, and, and the folks that I was talking to, most of them, frankly, did not care about impeachment. <laughs> so, well, because it got drugged. There it, was got, the, it was dragged out for so long that by the time that it was like, you know, you should have done it in April and just got it done with. And, and then the other part, though, is like, we I, controlled I would agree the with house. that. If you're going to do it, like, do it you know, punctually. Do it. You know, after we took back the House and I became a big supporter of Medicare for All, it quickly dawned on me that it's like, look, the Democrats control the House and we can't even get a floor vote on Medicare for All. And it was like, wait a second. What, why won't why won't Pelosi put it up for a vote? And that's when again it started to dawn on me. And you know it was like oh because the giant insurance companies are one of the biggest donors. Because you'd actually been working your heart out for uh, you know months and years to get them elected, and so that would be profoundly disappointing. I'm literally wearing outer known clothing right now because uh, they sent them to me and then I loved them. And so now we uh, have them as a sponsor of the podcast. And then I did something where I just like went on the site and bought it some more. And then they sent it to me too. You know what I did? I actually used my own discount code. Isn't that fun? I entered my code Yang at checkout to get 25% off my full price order. That's outerknown.com, O-U-T-E-R-K-N-O-W-N.com. Use code Yang at checkout for 25% off. So why do I like these clothes? They're made well, they're made sustainably, so you know that uh, you know, you're not hurting the environment any more than you'd have to. Uh, they were founded by pro surfer and 11 time world champion surfer, Kelly Slater. So it's got that vibe, you know what I mean? It's got that kind of comfortable, I'm a cool guy, like uh, I could be on a beach. It, it's kind of got that vibe, though, uh, it's not a really a beach because like one of the shirts that I wear all the time is called a blanket shirt. Uh, and it is so heavy that it is like wearing a blanket where oftentimes I'll just go outside and not bother with like a hoodie or whatnot because the blanket shirt is like wearing a blanket. So if that kind of stuff sounds good to you, check out outerknown.com. Use my code Yang at checkout for 25% off. It sounds like there was another phase, too, when you decided to go from uh, Warren to Bernie after Iowa, um, where also, like, folks re responded to in a way that also was like, wait a minute, like, shouldn't I be able to do this? Like, am I not, like, uh, uh, you know, an autonomous voter? And, like, if I, if I decide that this candidate is the candidate I'm going to support at this moment in time, like, is that not my right? Like, you know, I'm not some raging lunatic or whatnot. But, like, apparently folks uh, did not respond well even though in my mind you're 100 right it was totally your prerogative you're i'm glad you bring this up because i i helped raise maybe like twelve thousand dollars in grassroots donations for the warren campaign i was very active in helping her in 2019 and then yeah after i after iowa when it was clear that warren didn't have a path and i was very diplomatic about it i reached out even to one of the campaign staffers that was hand with that was in charge of the surrogates for Warren's campaign. And, you know, I said, look, like, I am proud of, of, of my involvement in the Warren campaign. And, you know, I hope she runs again. And, I, and, and she's ran a great race. But, you know, this moment in history demands progressive change. And there's so many, you know, if, if Warren stands for Medicare for all and all these policies that she's campaigning on, you know, Bernie's campaigning on them too. And now he has the momentum after Iowa and, and, and New Hampshire that, you know, he has a chance to really do this. And I think we need to consolidate the progressive movement behind Bernie. And, and their campaign, you know, they were, well, maybe just you know, support both of us and don't say that you're end endorsing Bernie. And I was like, well, you know, like it's my right. Like, like you just said, in, in a true democratic society, we all get to support, you know, who we think, who, who is the best candidate for the job in that moment. And in that moment, you know, in February of, of 2020, the person who was best suited, in my opinion, was Bernie Sanders. And so the day I endorsed Bernie and came out in support of him, I got more blowback. I mean, it, it, what you said is absolutely correct, Andrew. It was almost like I had, you know, committed a crime on national TV. I was getting so much blowback. They were telling me I was a horrible person, all because I just endorsed the person that I think was the was, and I still think would do the best job as president in this moment in our history. The the entire Warren team came after me. A lot of the more centrists in the Democratic Party came after me, and it just got so personal. And I just thought like. This is really ridiculous, all because I'm choosing to support who I want to support. And so in a way, you could say that these more kind of corporate 
liberals are the ones who kind of radicalized me even more when it was like, they're not even going to let me support and fight for who, for who and what I think, you know, what I want to fight for. Like, that's just, that's not democracy. And so this kind of blind obedience, I, I do think, and I think a lot of it was from, you know, I think that Democrats were so scared of Donald Trump. And just, you know, there was all this fear mongering. <laughs> that, that animated a lot of That it just made people be like, you know, I, they, but they made people be like, well, we just got to get rid of Trump. We just got, get, we just have to get rid of Trump. And then, but in my head, it's like, well, at what cost? Like, and I think that's the philosophical difference between like the Republican Party and the Democratic Party. The Republican Party, I disagree with them on pretty much everything. But what I, what I do admire about Republicans is they unapologetically fight for their agenda. You know, they unapologetically fight for their kind of, you know, hard right, almost, you know, white nationalistic agenda at times, especially Donald Trump, hard line on immigration. <laughs> you know, he's very it's unapologetic. It's funny you describe that. There, there was another guy who came on, uh, Matt Jones, who's a Democrat from Kentucky, and, and he said something that really, really stuck with me. He said that um, one thing Republicans do better than Democrats is they let some of like the internal um, fights uh, take their course. And then if, frankly, like, it, so if you have like a more extreme person who ends up like the nominee of your party in a particular congressional race, and you're like, oh, all right. Well, whereas, the, whereas according to Matt, and I think he's right, um, that the Democratic Party is always trying to like, like stick its nose in kind of earlier in the, um, in the process to try and keep um, progressives or folks who, who they think are in your mind, like unrealistic from like actually getting the resources necessary to, um, become the, the party's nominee in those races under the guise of electability, but there's like more to it than electability. And, and I think he was right. I think I was like, wow. So in that way, Republicans are more like lowercase D democratic because they'll really just let the will of the people, even if the people choose in some cases, like some freaking loons, because there are some freaking loons like <laughs> absolutely that are like, like, like that. peddling conspiracy theories that, that have no like basis the QAnon in reality. Person, like, like right, the you know, QAnon people. Green and like, yeah. yeah. But in the, the part that I'll get to, so while the Republicans kind of unapologetically fight for their agenda and they fight for their base, the Democrats, they, 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 they're always wanting to moderate their message. And they're always, the, the, the Democrats, are, and especially kind of the establishment, more corporatist Democrats, you know, they, they, instead of fighting for their progressive values and fighting for policies, the policies that their base wants, they, they think that they have to compromise, you know, their values to win. And what I would say, like, if you actually really want to win, not just an election, but win an agenda, a for the people agenda, then you don't have to compromise your values, especially while you're campaigning. And you haven't even gotten to the negotiating table yet with Republicans. You have to fight for your values and your progressive policies to win. And so I think there's just this fundamental difference. And I think if you look at kind of why does America, keep, for the last 50 years, do corporations get more and more power and billionaires get richer and richer, it's because the Republican Party keeps dragging us further and further to the right. And the Democratic Party, instead of offering like a real, you know, economic populist agenda Contrast. that's going to bring the country back and center people in our politics again, they kind of, they, they run on this kind of mushy middle. And they don't, and to be honest, they don't really stand for anything. Look at someone like Joe Biden. In this moment, when, when there's this much inequality and this much injustice, Joe Biden didn't run on Medicare for all. He didn't run on a Green New Deal. He didn't run on universal basic income like you did. He's not really running on any policy. He's just running on this kind of blanket statement. That, He's running well, on I'm, a return I'm to heal. normalcy. He keeps saying that I'm going to heal the soul, soul of, the of America. You know, I'm, I'm going to unite America. But how, and here's where you've got to take it a step further. And I know these uncomfortable truths, you know, some people don't want to hear it, but like, how are you going to heal the soul of America when you're resisting all the bold progressive policies that we need to heal the soul of America? I love how you've, you've actually started to try and translate the platitudes into policies. <laughs> like, like, I enjoy it a great deal. Um, so there were two things that, that uh, you were discussing or we were discussing before that I would love to try and uh, delve into. Um, so the first is... Uh, in part because of your treatment by some folks uh, during your endorsement of Bernie, um, you said, "Look, at this point, I can't even call myself a Democrat. I'm going. To, I'm going to go full socialist." You, it seems like you probably changed your tag to proud socialist, which you know, like I, I appreciate. I love your clarity and passion. Um, and then the uh, so the first thing I want to talk about is 
how to try and create a third party. Because earlier in this conversation, we talked about how like the duopoly is a problem. And if you take like someone who is for very progressive policies, then they're like, well, what are you going to do? Democratic party. And then you're like, oh, snap. Um, And then you talked about how the Green Party was trying to build up and that um, has not necessarily, you know, um, broken through. So number one, let's you and I talk about what the heck the, the future of the People's Party is and what the third party mechanics look like. And then the second thing, um, is that you talked about having to try and build both inside and outside pressure uh, to try and make various changes happen. Uh, and I would be curious as to see where you, where you see yourself. Um, what, what's strange is that, you know, I started out as like, frankly, like, I think pretty much an outsider. I mean, I'm just like a dude. Um, uh, but, but like now I'm kind of a bit of like an insider where like, again, members of Congress will speak to me, <laughs> you know, like, like, uh, I'm, you know, like, uh, I'm, um, and so I've been trying to use that to get cash relief passed and uh, like, I'm going to keep on pushing for various things. And most people who know me know that like, you know, I see cash relief as one in emergency for right now because like so many of us are hurting, but I also see it as a great way to prepare the ground for universal basic income because we'll have uh, like much more data and certainty and like people will love it and the rest of it. Um, so let's start with the mechanics of the the third party first. Well, I think actually, I think first it's important to kind of talk about maybe the strategy kind of, the, and I do think like you alluded to that, like, well, I'm a firm believer that we need an inside and outside strategy. And what that means is that, you know, there are progressives who are with working within the democratic party who believe that you, we can change the system from within. And then there's another school of thought that the system is, is so corrupt that it's and, and 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 because both of these parties are captured by giant corporations and Wall Street and the billionaire class, that they're going to continue to govern for and represent the corporate interests that that continue to donate to the parties and continue to give them power every election cycle. And so those are the kind of the two schools of thought. I kind of fall into the the thought the school of thought where like if we continue down this road of like you know look the Republican Party is is. You know, I could never see myself supporting the Republican Party. Um, but at the same time, if we're just going to continue to give Democrats power and and vote blue no matter who and demand nothing in return and not demand policy concessions uh, and demand that they actually work for the people, that, that yeah, the system is uh, corrupt beyond repair. Uh, and so what I mean by an inside-outside strategy is supporting, you know, the few progressives that we have. Um, and I, I want to applaud your uh, organization, Humanity Forward. A lot of the candidates that you endorsed this primary cycle, candidates like David Kim are candidates that I got behind and I endorsed. Candidates like Jen Perlman, you know, who just ran great people-centered Love David campaigns. and Jen. They're great Do- people. They're great people and they're in politics to actually help the people, which has kind of become a foreign concept in Washington, D.C., you know. And so and I and I applaud. That's when I kind of you caught my radar when I saw there was actually a tweet. You were like, I can't remember how it happened. But so for all those out there who don't think Twitter matters, like you had kind of I think you actually commented on one of my tweets. And and I wrote back like, well, would you would you look at some kind of more candidates that are not me, us candidates, more like from the Bernie side of the party? Um like Jen Perlman. And I listed off like 10 of these candidates and you wrote back, of course, like send them to Humanity Forward. And then like Humanity Forward endorsed, I think like six of the candidates, one of them being Jen Perlman. So I just saw right away that like you were someone who is trying to kind of use your influence not to kind of enrich yourself and not to kind of, you know, enrich your corporate donors because you don't have any corporate donors, but to actually help the people (laughs) and and to actually like do good things in our in this country for the people who desperately need help right now. And so that's when you caught on my radar and and I thought, okay, like this is this is awesome. And um so again, I support Thank you for sending those candidates over cuz I loved uh you know, anyone we endorsed I loved. And you know, like I spoke to any candidate that we were considering endorsing. And Jen freaking phenomenal. And the, the fact that she was challenging like Debbie Wasserman Schultz or whatever <laughs> you know, I was like, Derek Washington Schultz in Congress? <laughs> like, you know, like, that was my reaction because, you know, we knew her as a former head of the DNC. Um, uh, so that was, frankly, a pretty easy call. Uh, and, but, you know, David, David Kim ran against an incumbent. Um, and, um, and he got you know, outspent think, by 10 to 1 and he almost won. And that shows the, the power that the, the grassroots has. That and there was some bullshit used against David Kim, too. power. 
You know, he had his to, opponent he like spent... pretended Bernie. His opponent pretended Bernie endorsed him and stuff. Like there, there was some like dirty crap in that race. That was not cool. He did, and he also pretended his opponent pretended that like he was this big advocate for Medicare for all and a Green New Deal and universal basic income when he really just started talking about those policies more when David Kim was running on those policies. So of course, you know, the establishment is always going to fight back, but at least you know that's the inside strategy that to continue to build and elect true people-centered candidates that are actually going to govern uh, for the people and get in there and pass policies that will improve people's lives. So I support that strategy. I support, you know, the squad and, and the few candidates we have in Congress There's that some are really trying nice to wins challenge the status quo. In, in that, like, I was very sad about some of the candidates that did not win because some of them were tremendous. Like, I loved Alex Morse. Uh, Alex Morse was a very bright Alex future. Morse was phenomenal. In, I also some, endorsed some, his campaign. I, I, I agree. Like, let's keep building progressive power within the party. But I there's also a but coming. The, Here we go. There's a but. Here's the, here's the but. <laughs> when you really look at the Democratic Party, there's maybe about 10 or, or 12, if you're being generous, true progressives. I think even though we've really moved the, the, the narrative on progressive policies and the overwhelming majority of the American people now support Medicare for all. I think it's almost like 70% in recent polls. The majority of the American people support a Green New Deal and support uh, direct cash relief now. Uh, yep. So the majority of the American <laughs> yep. people support these, these policies that CNN and MSNBC and corporate Democrats call radical or extreme. Well, guess what? The majority of the people support these policies. Now, the reason these policies aren't, aren't passed into law is because the majority of our representatives don't work for the people. The major, you know, the reason that the Democrats don't support uh, Medicare for all is because the majority of the Democratic Party, just like the Republican Party, uh, is bought by the giant insurance companies and big pharma. You know, the reason they don't support a Green New Deal is because both parties are still bought by the big oil companies. You know, the reason they don't support really, truly ending these endless wars is because both parties are bought and paid for by the defense industry. And so when you come to unpack our political system, you see how much power big money still has. Big money is controlling the entire agenda in Washington. And so when I finally unpacked all of that. And I truly like as a lifelong Democrat, it is hard because again, in 2018, I would say, well, my political outlook was, well, the Democrats are the good guys and the Republicans are the bad guys, you know, um, or the Democrats are good for the people, whereas the Republicans are good for corporations. And my political outlook today is a lot more nuanced than that. I would say that court, you know, establishment Democrats are bad for the people and good for corporations. And Republicans are good for corporations and bad for people. And then I would say that like true progressives are, you know, good for the people. And that's what we need. We need people that just want to represent the people and not these powerful special interests. And so when you unpack the Democratic Party, unfortunately, the majority of Democrats, they might talk a good game on CNN and again, spout those platitudes, but they're not actually fighting for the policies we need to move this country forward. So when you see that, that's when you realize that we need to also pressure these parties from outside of, you know, we need to build power outside of these two corporate parties. And that's when I got involved with the movement for People's Party. Uh, and there actually, there's been some intersection, right, between the movement for People's Party and Humanity Forward that, uh, and I don't know if people know this, like six months ago, we were protesting uh, outside of, of Democrats and Republicans' homes. We went outside of Susan Collins' house, in, in Maine, we went outside of Mitch uh, McConnell's house in Kentucky. We went outside of Nancy Pelosi's house in San Francisco. And we demanded that, that, that these legislators, that these, uh, you know, that these Congress people bail out the people and not their corporate donors. We were demanding direct cash relief, $2,000 a month. We were demanding uh, Medicare for all. Uh, we were demanding a moratorium on, uh, uh, on rents and mortgages throughout the pandemic. And, and, and your organization helped us spread the word about this event. And again, I'm just one of those people who like, when I saw that you were willing to stick your neck out for a little grassroots organization, like the Movement for a People's Party, that to me shows that you're the real deal because you actually care about helping the people. You're not in it to I do care because you're a careerist and you're trying to advance your career and you're not in it because you want more power for yourself. You're actually in it because you want to give more power to the people. And and that might just sound so basic, but like that is really everything. Because oh, when that, you've got a government Ryan. that is that is captured by corporate money, finding real people who actually want to, you know, advance 
and help the people is, is rare in politics. I remember that series of events and like I, I saw what you were asking for and I was like, yeah, I agree with all that. Like, I mean, that, that and in this case too, where you were, uh, you were fighting for the people and so it was very easy to support you, uh, at least we could do. Um, I know Scott Santins, who's a good friend of mine, uh, spoke at the event and there were some other folks too that are friends of mine that spoke. Scott Santins was amazing. He gave a great pitch at, uh, you're talking about the People's Convention where we held the yeah. first uh, ever oh, yeah, that's People's a different Convention. Event, that's true. Uh, and Scott spoke there very eloquently about the benefits of UBI and uh, what that looks like, especially now that we're seeing more and more jobs being displaced by this predatory capitalism. Uh, and, you know, Scott gave a great pitch and Cornell West was there and Nina Turner. And it was, it was, we had this amazing event. And after the event, everyone, we took a vote to see if people wanted to start a new major party. Uh, and they voted overwhelmingly, I think like 95%. And we had like 2 million people watch uh, the convention, which is a big deal because Yay. we were covered by CNN or MSNBC. And, you know, we couldn't get any corporate media to cover it. But again, and, but I also want to caution people here. Like starting a new party is is tough work like this is hard work oh the Again, duopoly like, is very very strong they're and very one of the strong things, and they're very one, powerful one of, they control everything really they, like one of the two do. controls and they've everything. been building this power like i said for a century uh and so this is going to be a process we just uh we now filed to be on the ballot in maine so we're now we're on one state like the people's party is 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 on one state and it's again our goal is to be on almost like i think 30 states by 2022 and all 50 wow. states by 2024 again there's it takes time so, to get so tell access. the people here yeah how does ballot access work um going from one to 30 states Ballot access is not my expertise. Let me be very clear about that. We have a, ba <laughs> we have a ballot ac uh, access It is a thing. It's true. You that we work with. It's very that. technical. Like every state is different. Some states you have to have like a candidate who runs for governor and get like 1% of the vote. And other states you just have to get, you know, a thousand signatures, which with all of our combined social media power it's is easy. very easy. Yeah. Uh, but again, the idea, the, and the, the idea of the People's Party and, and building outside of the corporate parties it's really simple. It's basically like, you know, Wall Street has two parties in Washington and the people really have none. And so the idea is to build a party that will not take one dollar of corporate PAC money. I think if you were to really be honest and do an honest assessment of our politics, the, the, there's two things I think that has corrupted our politics. The first is corporate PAC money and allowing these giant corporations to be able to essentially buy politicians. Uh, because remember, politicians write our laws in America. So if you can buy a politician, you're basically getting to buy access and buy favoritism. So when these laws are written in our Congress, the laws, when we talk about a rigged system, what we're talking about is we have politicians who write laws that favor their corporate donors and, 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 and are rigged against you know, the working class and everyday Americans. That's what we mean by a corrupt and rigged system, that the, it's, it's baked into the laws that are written. And so... Uh, the, the, that's the first thing that's corrupted our politics is corporate PAC money. And then the second thing is corporate lobbyists who now, not only do they buy our politicians, they also have lobbyists who go in, who, who corporations pay to go in and, and lobby them even more. So, so they've, they've essentially bought them and they have people in Washington who are now getting to, to advocate directly with our, our representatives and get laws passed that favor them. And a good example of that is the Affordable Care Act. A lot of people don't know this. When the Affordable Care Act was written in 2010, uh, the, about 4,000 corporate lobbyists descended on Washington <laughs> to write that legislation. And then you've got, you know, so, you know, the, the Affordable Care Act, well, yes, you know, it, maybe there was a little bit of good it did. It was really a gift to these giant insurance companies because they sent lobbyists in there to get everything they kind of wanted in the bill. Uh, and it left 27 million Americans without insurance. And we've actually seen, you can go look at any chart, since the Affordable Care Act was passed in 2010, premiums have just skyrocketed since then. And yes, Republicans have done some sabotage to it. But at the end of the day, it is still a predatory for-profit healthcare system. The fact they took the public option out is really what, what neutered the whole thing. Totally. And again, that happened when Democrats had the House and the Senate and the White House. So here they had, you know, they had all three branches of government. Had a golden opportunity. And they, and they had a golden opportunity to like actually pass a public option or, or Medicare for all. And again, they, 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 they governed for their corporate donors. I'm going to make a pitch to you, Ryan. I'm going to make a pitch to you that I think you're going to be aligned with, I believe. I think that the corruption you're talking about 
is actually baked into the way that these elections take place. And it goes back to the duopoly uh, issue where, um, so the numbers that have stuck in my mind is that Congress nationally has a 21% approval rating, uh, but incumbents who decide to run have a 94% reelection rate. Uh, and so the accountability uh, is lacking. Um, and I know a lot of uh, individual members who I regard as genuinely good people who want to do good things. Um, but I think the structural incentives around the way that we elect and reelect leaders actually is another corruptive influence that I want to try and wedge into your agenda. Um, and, and I want to wedge into your agenda because I think that this is the path to the true viability of a third party in the duopoly is having open primaries and ranked choice voting. Um, I think that if you have another party in like Maine or these other places, it's going to be extraordinarily difficult if the entire, um, certainly congressional process, I mean, there are local races that are very important and we can fight those out. But, uh, but in these congressional races, if you have a party primary, like, you know, the, the candidate's never going to be anywhere near it. So you need open primaries and ranked choice voting. And then the other big part of it is then that gets rid of the cudgel where they can say like, look, don't waste your vote. You vote for uh, some third party, then you're going to be enabling the quote unquote bad guys to win. Um, and so you, you need, need to vote for us. So to me, that's the big structural fix that actually will enable any kind of um, uh, modification to the duopoly. You're absolutely right. There, I, there's two structural fixes. One of them, like you said, is ranked choice voting. Uh, and, you know, one of the ways these more establishment Democrats keep staying in office is you're absolutely right. They kind of use this lesser of two evils argument, kind of like, you know, well, what are you going to do? Vote for them? You know, and so it's not a bad voting, argument sometimes. <laughs> yeah, right. But again, if that's all Democrats stand for, like vote for us because we're not as bad as them. You know, like if, if, if the American it's not people... A, it's, if, not, it's not a way to get real change across the finish line. Absolutely. I, I if every election, and I, w I would argue, you know, there's a, there's a writer I love. His name is Hunter Thompson. And he argued all the way back in 1972 in one of his essays that the Democratic Party, uh, you know, that they, their whole shtick is, is by, you know, vote for us because we're the lesser of two evils. That's how long this has been going back, that they actually, he says, they don't advocate for meaningful progressive change. Their whole thing is, you know, vote for us because we're not as bad as them. I think there was a point in the past, the distant past, when like big change was actually on the agenda in Washington, but it's been a long time. It's been a lifetime. It has been a long time. And I think if every election cycle, your two options are, are evil or lesser evil, how is the country ever going to get better? At some point, we have to vote for good. The whole good point of ranked choice voting is you can no longer, like, it actually matters. You, you rank your candidate. So you can vote for, say, the first candidate. I'm going to vote for Andrew Yang as my number one, let's say, for instance, if we had ranked choice voting, and then in the, in the primary in 2024. And then number two, I'm going to vote for, you know... Whoever the Democrat is. Whoever it is, yeah. Or say, yeah, exactly. And then number three is, you know if they wanted to vote for the Republican. So it ranks it. So like you, you, you actually have to, and actually their studies have shown that ranked choice voting leads to more positive campaigning. And, and yep. because right now our campaign is so negative. you can't just so trash negative. each other. It's so it's toxic, man. I'm in Georgia. It's about tearing each other down it's instead so of lifting people up. <laughs> it is so bad. It's and so the whole idea with ranked choice voting is it actually matters how many number two votes you get and how many yes. people ranked you in number three. So you have to speak to more of the electorate because you, you're, you know, it matters like where you land, you know, so getting a lot of second place votes actually helps you in ranked choice voting. Yeah. I, I, so you should know, like, I'm going to want to team up with you and whoever's working on ranked choice voting. And that's one of our big initiatives for the People's Party. But then number two, and I'd say actually more important than ranked choice voting, is, is ending no. Citizens United. It oh, yeah. Corporate, corporate finance, <laughs> public financing moving, of yeah, elections. Getting, yeah. getting the public financing of elections. Because even if we have ranked choice voting, if you have, if, you're, if these corporations are able to just basically buy our politicians and someone has, you know, $5 million in the bank when they're, for their campaign, and then the progressive has $100,000, which is usually how, you know, I've had, I've talked to so many progressive candidates, and they say the number one thing that impedes their is that they don't have as much money as these incumbents because 
that, you know, they have to raise $3, $4 and $5 grassroots donations, which is good because they, they know that they're beholden to the people who've, who've rate, who've given them, who've given them money. But the problem is, is when you get, when you're running against an incumbent who gets $5 million uh, of corporate PAC money, they just have the ability to then go and buy a bunch more media and, and, and communicate to the public. And then the messages they communicate, they're not telling the public with that $5 million that, that this was bought and paid for. And, and I, I'm a corporate Democrat who's going to go in there and give Wall Street more power. They use that $5 million to say, oh, I'm for the people. I'm going to represent your family. I'm going to make this pitch to you, Ryan, again. Um, I agree with everything you just said, that money in politics is destroying us and Citizens United is a terrible deal that made a bad situation much, much worse. Um, and that if we could uh, end Citizens United and have public financing of campaigns, it would be a game changer for uh, the candidates that you and I are talking about. Um, the, the, the reason I'm going to press on ranked choice voting again is that uh, in order to amend Citizens United, you would need uh, congressional control, like it's debatable whether or not, where you might even need a constitutional amendment, because I think the Supreme Court ruled that, you know, like corporate donations are free speech, uh, which I they totally did. disagree with. Um, yep. and, and so, but the, the, the great thing about ranked choice voting is that it can happen uh, at the state level. Yep. where there are 26 states where you have ballot initiatives um, and it doesn't take that much to get on a ballot initiative. In, in it doesn't. Various... And we already saw this cycle. It was in Massachusetts. They just passed it in Alaska. So now we have ranked choice voting in Alaska. We have ranked yeah, choice voting in Maine. Yeah, your old stomping ground. Exactly, my old stomping <laughs> ground. So you're absolutely right about that. Ranked choice voting and then, you know, obviously public fu funding of elections. Those two things will help us break the duopoly. And not just, when I say break the duopoly, a lot of it is, look, if there's another viable third party where the Democrats can't play and the Republicans, they can't pit, you know, it's not just, they can't blame the other side. You know, right now in our politics, nothing gets done in Washington, D.C. because Democrats blame Republicans and point the finger at them. And then Republicans point the finger at Democrats. And while they're busy scapegoating each other, the nation's problems aren't being solved. And so if we had a viable third party, no longer anymore, you know, finally progressives, first of all, we'd have somewhere to go. So the Democratic Party would actually have to earn our votes. They'd actually have to work for our votes and they couldn't take the progressive base for granted. Um, you know, so that is a that's a huge part of this, too. Um, it's just, you know, again, holding these two corporate parties accountable. Um, so this is the tricky thing is that if you are one of the two major parties, how do you feel about ranked choice voting? You know, maybe not that great because right now you can control who gets nominated most of the time and like the, the rest of it. Um, but there's no principled argument against it. Uh, uh, and so this is the, to me, the opportunity. Um, yeah, you can have ballot initiatives in 26 states plus D.C. Um, and there also are, you know, you can get it through state houses in the other 24 states. So there are still possibilities. There are two states that have already implemented it uh, in the form of Maine and Alaska. There are various cities that have implemented it. Uh, St. Louis, I just heard, implemented it. So, uh, so that to me is the path. This is like the mechanical problem and the structural problem uh, where, uh, and it is an uphill battle. I commend you for... Uh, starting uh, this effort with the People's Party, uh, because I, I firmly believe that we need to have more genuinely democratic representation, to have a more responsive, dynamic government and political system. And you know, the United States is somewhat unusual or almost unique in having just two major parties. Like other places, like you, you have a more genuine parliamentary system, you have to work. If you get some other independent actors into Congress, like they could end up being tie-breaking votes and have outsized influence and power. Um, so I'm a huge fan of this plan and I, I'm uh, going to be supporting you in anything that pushes ranked choice voting across the finish line in these, part, in these uh, states. Yeah, and I would just also add on to what you're saying is, uh, you know, we are one of the, in some ways you could call us, you know, some people call say that we're a two-party system, uh, but when you really unpack like we have in this 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 conversation that both parties essentially, yeah, there's some smaller differences between the two parties and, and there's some definitely some cultural differences that are that are important, but in essence, when both parties are, are beholden to corporate interests and are working for their corporate donors. In some respects, you know, a lot of people call our government a one-party oligarchy. And, and, and that's dangerous. You know, we need to move from like this one-party oligarchy to a multi-party democracy, like they have in most European nations, like they even have in Canada and, and in Mexico. And I, and I would add this, that as soon as Canada got their more progressive party, 
they also got a universal healthcare system. And in Mexico, the same thing happened. So I just think that Americans need more choices. We need more choices. We need better choices. Multi-party democracy. I co-signed that vision with you, Ryan. Vibrant, dynamic, multi-party democracy. And if the and if the other parties are so comfortable in their agenda, then why are they so afraid? Why would why would they be so afraid? Rank choice voting, people. Let, let's make it happen. Um, Ryan, I have enjoyed this conversation immensely. Uh, I genuinely like like your your uh, clarity of vision is remarkable. Do you have anything you want to promote uh, or share? Um, Not really. I mean, uh, I want to just thank you for fighting for direct cash relief for the people. I want to uh, encourage people to keep, you know, I know we've all been calling our senators and our Congress people, but, uh, you know, look, I just, again, you know, when we have a government right now that is better at waging endless wars and is better at bailing out their corporate donors uh, than actually providing relief to, to, to the people during a pandemic, you know, it means we have real problems in this country. And so I just want to applaud everyone who is, you know, demanding better and, you know, stop worshiping politicians. They're not there to be worshiped, question them, challenge them, demand better from them. And when they're not working for the people, vote them the heck out and get someone in there that is going to support your family and is going to support policies that improve you, that improve your lives. Um, you know, you can check out my podcast. Uh, I have a show that I put on once a week and we talked, we had David Kim on the podcast. We had Jen Perlman on the podcast. We have a lot of people who support UBI on the podcast. Uh, you can check that out. It's amped up podcast. You can get it on Apple podcasts, uh, or wherever you, you stream your podcasts. And, uh, Thank you for having me on, on, on the show, Andrew. And again, you know, I, I might be a little more progressive than you, but I, I want to thank you for being a bridge builder. You know, I, I do think if we're ever going to solve these problems, you know, one of the things I think the Democratic Party doesn't do well is they just, instead of bringing progressives into the party, and for, for Biden, for instance, instead of bringing in true progressives into his cabinet, they keep kind of alienating us and they keep kind of pushing us away. And I think if we're ever going to solve these problems, we need more bridge builders like you. We need people that want to have uncomfortable conversations and want to bring more people and more thought uh, into the conversation. So I want to thank you for oh, thanks, man. this opportunity and thank you for all the work that you've been doing. Oh, thank you, Ryan. I appreciate it. Uh, you know, I think that most people want the same things for ourselves. Uh, and I'll work with anyone who wants to help people, like you said, uh, certainly anyone who wants to get cash into people's hands uh, or healthcare uh, into everyone's homes or towns. Uh, you know, um, I'm with you on all of these fronts. So I would love to team up with you on that. And kudos to you, really. Like, uh, it's it's been a lot of fun sitting down and talking to you. Likewise. Thank you for listening in. I hope you enjoyed this conversation. If you did, Please do subscribe to Yang Speaks and click on notifications so we can let you know every time we have a new episode.